Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, a Toyota Corolla Touring Sports 2-liter XL special edition. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. Uh, Toyota Corolla, so what are we going back to the 90s here, Alan, or is something else happening? Well, look, it's quite simple, Andrew. I mean, the Toyota Corolla replaces the Toyota Iris, which replaced the Toyota Iris, which replaced the Toyota Corolla and the other seven generations before it ah of course of course silly me i why i got confused i have no idea exactly yes it's the toyota corolla uh, which replaced what was previously the iris in this case it is not just any toyota corolla it's the estate version obviously the corolla is also available as a hatchback and as the lesser spotted saloon i mean the uk they do the saloon they do all oh, right okay. yeah they do the saloon it's only available in a few specs i'll come to that in a bit okay and also with the smaller of the two drive trains the one i had was the well the wind back a little bit alan corolla in the uk are available with two different drive trains right they are related uh so there's a 1.8 and there's a two liter and both of them are hybrids as well okay so the 1.8 puts out 120 brake horsepower, the 2-litre 181 brake horsepower, which is far more like it. <laughs> there used to be a 1.2-litre petrol manual hatchback. It was discontinued at the end of the 2019 mon- model year. So hybrid only. Okay. The saloon is only available with the 1.8-litre drivetrain. Right here. The hatch and the Touring Sports, which is an estate, by the way, I should explain that, Touring sport means estate, and I'll probably refer to it in a number of different ways on the way through because touring sports is rather long-winded and a bit pretentious whenever you have to keep saying it every few moments. (laughs) So the hatch and the touring sports are built at Burdison in Derbyshire. Mm -hmm. The saloon is built in Turkey. Okay. And uh, all the engines are from D-Side in North Wales. So it is a particularly British car, this one. Specs between hatchback and saloon and touring sports are pretty much similar. The difference being that the estate is not available with the two-tone colour schemes, nor with the 18-inch alloy wheels. Right. There's a couple bits. So if you've seen a really sexy-looking hatchback version, are you sure it's a Corolla? No, that's not fair. Wow. It's just that you're starting this review off really crikey. It's really bad. It's okay, I'll make up for it. Then it might not be possible to get exactly the same spec of a state. There are a number of trim levels. Now, listen carefully, everyone, because this can get a little bit complicated. There is, starting from the bottom up, Icon, Icon Tech. So Icon is a bit, you know, it's the sort of bare bones one, really. And it's not particularly bare bones, but Icon Tech actually gets you things like parking sensors and things. Okay. So really, Icon's there so that you buy Icon Tech. Uh, <laughs> and then there's Design. Uh, the saloon's only available in those three trims. Both Hatch and Estate are available in each of the three kind of offshoot ones. So these aren't sort of one above the other. Uh, there's, they've got different sort of styles. So you've got GR Sport, which is sporty. You've got uh, Trek, which is the rugged, lifted with cladding version. And you've got XL, which is the luxury, all the toys version. And it was the XL version that I was driving. Okay. Prices start from £24,185 for a 1.8 litre Icon hatch and rise to £31,735 for a 2 litre XL Touring Sports. Options, uh, it's not that many options. I mean, most of them are paint related. Metallic paint is a £600 option. Pearlescent paint is £900. There are bitone colour schemes as well, where the sort of from the bottom of the glass house up is black, and then you've got your colour below. Uh, they're £820 for metallic, £1,120 for pearlescent. There are limitations on which models can be bitone. Okay. In other words, not the estates. Right. The only other factory fitted options are a panoramic roof for £960 and the eight speaker JBL premium stereo for £450. If I remember correctly from previous Toyota reviews, is what one would expect as options with other manufacturers 
are aligned to whether it's the GR Sport, the Trek, or the XL. Basically, yes. That's why there are many different models. Yeah. And after that, you know, after those factory ones, then there are other sort of dealer fit options as well. Mm-hmm. So you could order a Protection Plus pack, for example, which includes a boot liner, mud flaps, a rear pl- bumper plate, okay. rubber floor mats and scuff plates. But that's dealer fit. That's not factory fit. Okay. So there's all sorts of bits and pieces like that. I had a couple of dealer fit options too. Model I had was the 2-litre XL Touring Sports, top of the range estate, Mm -hmm. with the JBL Premium Stereo and the Scarlet Flare Pearlescent Paint, which is a really nice red colour. And it came in at £33,085 on the road. Uh, As we record, there are many deals, finance offers, including 0%. With a seven hundred pound deposit contribution, right. based on the configs I had, that came in around about five hundred pounds a month. Okay, I'm sure you could jiggle it if you. That was a quite a low deposit and ten thousand miles a year. So if you jiggle it about a bit, it'll be in that region. Right, not ridiculous really, given that it had all the to- has all the toys. I also had a couple of dealer fit options. Uh, the first were the crossbars for the roof that go between the sort of built in roof rail things. And they are about £220. Now, the prices were on the Toyota website until about two days ago. (laughs) Because I'd looked at them and they've disappeared. So the last time I looked, they were about £220 for the crossbar. And I also had a bike holder for about £120. Maybe it was £110. But that gives you... You don't have to have the Toyota bike holder, obviously. It's it's very similar to a a well-known Swedish brand. But Toyota badge but the crossbars were, were good. They were sort of aero, and they've got a little rubber insert stuff to stop things moving about too much when you're driving, and that turned out to be very useful, as we shall discuss later on. <laughs> so what does this look like then? So Because this, this is... We all know what a, an Aorus looked like. Did we? Yes. Was it... Was it, it was a bit of... Come on, let's face it. The, Aor- the we know Aorus it- was a bit of a was a bit of a cure for insomnia to look at wasn't it 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 wasn't a standout design that made people turn heads but we've all seen it although some may not realize that's what they've seen yeah the corolla is it's quite hard it's one of these cars that's quite hard to describe because it is a good looking thing yes and often when we're talking about good looking things we then sort of say well you know it's not very fussy it doesn't have all sorts of bits everywhere but the front of the Corolla is actually quite it's a tricky one it's got a very it's got quite a prominent grille it is distinctive but it's by current standards it's not overly aggressive which seems weird because then you look at it and you look at the sort of sharp angles and you look at that it's a little bit scowly and you think really by current gives you an idea of just how aggressive the look of of most cars have has become yeah the thing is that all the lines kind of go places even if they kind of stop they normally carry on a little bit further on and you get the impression that some things are multi-dimensional so some things go above others if you know what i mean it's a bit where the lines disappear it's like if you tie a knot and so you see a piece of string go around one place and then it goes under another piece and then it comes out again yeah yeah and you get a little bit of a feeling that that's happening, especially at the bottom of the lower grille and the way that some of the parts go up and sort of intersect with bits of the headlamps, but they don't. But there's a grill in the way. They don't really intersect. I've just made a real mess of that. No, no. But when people see the pictures, mm. they will they will understand what you're trying to say. Also, I'd I'd add that the lines on the Corolla are quite clean. When you say yeah. about aggressive, a lot of... A lot of design these days is about putting hacks and swooshes and slashes in the sides of cars over wings and this sort of stuff. But this doesn't do it. What what really struck me looking at your photographs is how clean it is. I mean, that's absolutely true. There's some stuff happening ahead of the front wheels. But once you get behind the front wheels, it, it sort of evens out and settles down. Which is kind of ironic, because often whenever people are talking about some modern cars, they say, oh, it looks like the back was was designed by a completely different group of people from the front. And bizarrely, the Corolla Touring Sports, that is actually the case. There were two different teams. So it was the front was also designed and signed off or worked towards for the hatch and for the for the touring sports and then they they split and japan kept working on the hatch and the design team in europe 
uh, did the did the estate. So I think it's a really good looking car, particularly today. In that segment, there are so many thanks a lot in part to safety regulations. There is only so many things you can do in that size car with the safety protection that is required now and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. That you only have so much leeway and the angles things need to be at. But I think it's a really good looking car. And five, ten years ago, I would have happily mocked the grill. I know. It's but a, now I think it looks great. I think it works well because they they've done stuff within it as well. It's not just like a large mouth that's open. It, no. it they've it's not one of those grills where some other manufacturers at the moment have just gone, we've just got masses of black grill or chrome. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. There's because there's a little it looks almost like a a bit of a front splitter. In in the red, which is a gorgeous red, as you said, which helps break it up and adds mm. a bit of interest. Oh, God, crikey, listen to us. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know. I don't know quite what you've been drinking this evening, but I think one of the one of the things I've heard, I've heard people say this is a dull looking car, and I I completely disagree with that. I think it's a handsome car. Mm. Uh, um, the Corolla design, and there is a significant difference between between the two. I feel, yeah. I also think that the estate, by the way, is the best looking of the three body styles. Estates are generally the best looking of <laughs> quite often hands. <laughs> Partly in this case because the wheelbases are 110 mil longer than the hatch. So this isn't just something has been stuck on the back. Yeah. There has been uh, some engineering change in there as well. And it's got a relatively long overhang at the back, which kind of balances the fact that it has quite a long overhang at the front uh, too. Uh, Excel had roof rails on. I had the roof bars and the bike rack on for all of the time I had the car, even with them on and with nothing else on them, you know, without a bike or without anything else. They really didn't make any noticeable wind noise. Oh, that's good. Nor did they seem to buff it. Not that it was particularly windy, to be honest, uh, but they didn't add any wind noise and they didn't stick up a stupid amount. No. So sometimes you see roof racks. I, I know the aftermarket one I have on the GRMN. Um, it sticks up a bit far. I just wish it was like an inch and a bit lower because it's a bit generic. These ones didn't. Uh, it, it is really quite quite close to the roof, um, so it's it's quite neat in there. The XL has seventeen inch wheels on the the estate. Uh, they're ten spoke and they're actually black, but with sort of the fronts of the spokes polished to try to make it look like they have many more spokes and many more thinner spokes. They look good. I don't really fancy cleaning them. Uh, but it looks good but they do look good the 18 inch ones you can have on the hatch are even nicer okay uh there's a really nice kind of uh, five spoke one again pretty much every wheel you can get for this car it's worth mentioning is sort of black painted and then with polished bits to highlight stuff it's it's sort of not not possible to get any that that are just a solid color uh similar the color and the red is really good the best color you can get for the whole range is called Titan Bronze. And that's a kind of browny, greeny gray, which is a sort of bronze <laughs> color as opposed okay. to red. But that just makes us sad. It looks like the color of grease. And that, that means, and I don't mean that in a bad way at all. I think it's really lovely. One of the first times I saw the this generation of Corolla was actually in the south of France and it had the 18 inch wheels and it had the Titan bronze color and in the sun and it just looked amazing. But because it's only two it's only available in the bitone. Oh. So the top bit's black, you can't get it on the Tour Sports. It's a real shame. If you do want brown on the state then there is a colour which I didn't check out the the name of, which is available on the Trek one. Well, points off for Toyota there, then. Uh, the red is very nice. The red is very nice. There's also quite a nice denim blue. Other than that, it, you're very much into... It's 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 pretty monochrome. There's a black, there's a couple of greys, there's a couple of whites. You can have a pearlescent white and you can have a plain white. From memory, because I forgot to write this down, the only color which doesn't have a color tax is the plain white uh, i'm sure if i'm wrong someone will correct me yes <laughs> okay so inside then inside as is traditional let's start at the back 
Uh, the boot is a decent 581 litres in the 2 litre. In the 1.8, it's 598 litres. I have no idea why it's a different size. It's about 1.8 lit- metres long with the seats up. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1.4 meters wide at the widest point and 520 mil deep to the bottom of the parcel shelf tunnel cover thingy. That means that a reasonably sized cool box can stand uh, in the back using the 12 volt socket. If you've dropped the boot floor, there's two different positions in there. There's also, if you have it in the upper position, there's an undercroft, uh, which is handy. And there's an area to the left, which is has a little plastic partition. And so if you've got the boot floor up, then it'll act as a sort of baguette or melon retainer. Or if you've got a big bag of croissants, it sits quite neatly in there rather than rolling around the floor. These are things that happen all the time. (laughs) Or if you've got it down, you can remove the little plastic bit so that it's a fraction wider. Okay. Should you need, want, or desire. Uh, The one I had had a full-size spare wheel. What? Did they know? Did Toyota know? (laughs) It had. I'm sure. It was, I'm now having a moment of doubt as to whether it was full size or not. I'm sure it was. Well, even a tire at a, all. Is, it it is a had bonus. a spare wheel. <laughs> yeah, which kind of thwarted me because I couldn't find a compressor to blow up a paddling pool and thought, ah, there'll be one in the car, and it. You know, lifted up the floor. It was like, oh, damn! How dare they? <laughs> which I know is not what people normally say, but yes, uh, th- this one had a full size spare wheel. First world motoring journalist problems. <laughs> It was it was a little bit. The one thing about that that I do notice is, and I didn't get a chance to actually check, is that when I flick through the price list that's here, it tends to have some of the models mentioned twice. And one is, for example, one here is Icon Tech, and then the next line is Icon Tech plus TRK. And they generally come in at the same price. The only thing I can see which ties up with TRK is tire repair kit. So just uh, do check okay. if it comes with a spare wheel or not, or if you can choose between the two. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the only thing I can I can think of on that. So just just be aware of that, folks. If you're looking in in that much that much depth, boot floor is carpeted, but on the carpety side, it's got these kind of nice chrome edge runners on it which look kind of classy, make it look kind of expensive. Uh, But they've also got rubber down the middle. And what's really good about that is you can put something on it, like a box, and it won't move around. Ah, that's handy. But it still allows you to slide something in and out without gouging the carpet. Yes, is that as well. It's like someone's thought about it. How dare they? (laughs) Well, exactly. Uh, it's not just that. There's also there are also, of course, hooks around the side if you want to put a, a net a net on it or something. Yeah. If you turn the floor over, then it has a hard plastic side, uh, which has a bit of a lip around it. Just to, it's not very deep, but a little shallow lip and sort of some raised bits. So if you wanted to put dirty wellies or something on it, then you can just wipe that side down rather than actually getting getting the carpet dirty or scuffing the chrome bits or whatever perfect for all the people who feel the need to hose out a car yes so uh, if you're if you're upset that the Ineos Grenadier is being made in France or it's going to be made in France then you can buy a British built car that you can hose part of it out uh shall I move on now see that's now in Toyota's marketing <laughs> it's a British built car you could hose out there you go yes we'll give you that for free bits of it out yeah, I'll have an £8,000 discount on GR Yaris for that idea, if you don't mind. Or Supra. Or, or Supra, yeah. Uh, it's worth mentioning, by the way, that the 2020 model... Uh, so I had a 2019 model. So there's been a couple of tiny model re- revisions. One of them is that the new model comes with a power rear tailgate with a kick sensor. The one I had, because it was the former Auto Express long-termer, didn't. I-, I felt no loss at that whatsoever, by the way. But just not a... Not a problem at all. Uh, still talking about the boot. I'm sorry, there is so much to talk about at the back of this car, and we keep interrupting ourselves. The lighting is worth a mention. So often in the state cars, you find that the lighting is either up in the roof, and then, of course, you've got the tonneau cover out so it doesn't get underneath, or it is like 
it's like somebody's got a little tea light in the bottom corner yes. of the boot, and there's just and you can't see anything. You can kind of see maybe where your first aid kit is or whichever cubby it's sitting in, but you can't actually see what it is you might want to see. And this, on the sort of bottom of the plastic bits below the window where it meets the carpeted sides, is there are there is a kind of LED illuminator strips that go almost the full depth of the boot. And they actually illuminate the area you are probably interested in when you go into the boot of a car in the at night. The area where the luggage is. I, I've seen from your pictures that looks really good. And I like the way, again, it's becoming a bit of a theme here. People are thinking this through. Being LED and it being the boot, that will last the lifetime of the vehicle yeah. pretty much. Unless someone's going to be doing 400,000 miles in it. Even then, it's a Toyota, mate, so it yeah. probably still last. Yeah. <laughs> so from that point of view, it's brilliant. The fact that they're pointed where you would actually need them to be, extra bonus points, uh, as mm. far as I'm concerned, because <laughs> I am thoroughly sick to death of going into the boot of cars where you go, I will get the torch out on my phone to see things. <laughs> yeah, I never needed that. Never needed that. Uh, there's also a 12 volt socket in the boot, which I think I've talked said already. Uh, two molded in curry hooks, which work quite well for quick uh, supermarket trips. And there are also uh, release handles at the back of the boot so that you can pull them and flop the back seats down remotely, at least release it. It doesn't sort of go brang or do anything fancy. It just releases from the back so that you can then just go around to the side doors and, and, and just flick them forward. Okay. Um, if you don't have anything long enough to just shovel them from the boot. Uh, so that's quite clever uh rear seats they are slightly sculpted i confess i didn't really spend that long back there neither did anyone else but the dog was quite happy with them um <laughs> on her ta- on her towel there are air vents uh, which she liked because she could put her nose right up close to them and there are also personal lights uh, which she didn't play with but i guess that if you wanted to read a book or do something like that in the back uh in the back seat uh then you can actually illuminate uh your space uh there did seem plenty of rear, rear legroom behind me you know uh doing the old uh sleep beside behind myself i can easily fit in type test and so there did seem Plenty of legroom, no sort of scuffing of knees on the backs of the seats or anything like that. Supposedly, the front to rear couple distance is 928 millimeters, and that's best in class, according to the press pack. The seats, the one other thing that was in the, the press pack was actually that the seats are particularly slim to just make sure that there is the best legroom uh, in class. I guess for the 1.8 liter, which I would not necessarily be surprised if I saw it at an airport taxi rank either new or slightly used that's really important we have a few round our way Mm. they have become incredibly popular with our local taxi firms yeah and having been in them not lately but before lockdown there was plenty of room in the back Mm -hmm. plenty of room for an adult let alone if you've got kids or stuff yeah seats in the xl spec are part leather so they're a combination of fabric in the sort of main city area or backy area, Swedish bits on the sides of the bolsters and leatherish uh, on the sort of tops and sides of the bolsters with sort of red highlights and stitches. Despite my description, they are really good looking and they are really comfortable. Um, the sports seats in the front are quite heavily bolstered. They're not overly hard or overly firm, but the bolsters do actually do what bolsters are meant to do and kind of hold you in place, but without you ever feeling squashed or being hard to climb in over to get mm-hmm. into the seat, which can happen as well. I did here in home in Corby down to Burgundy, and on the way down, I did it with only a couple of short food and technical breaks on the way, because I, I happened to turn up in time for the train before the one I was meant to at the, the tunnel. I think I stopped for fuel in Ashford. I had to stop for a technical on the other side, and then I stopped once more for some dinner but that was me, and that was 500 and something miles. Uh, So, yeah, really comfortable, and that's about as much as you... That was as minimal stopping and as much going as really... It's it's more than anyone sensible would do in one go. Yeah. I I would have spent less time in it had I been allowed out of my car in the tunnel, for example. (laughs) Uh, Front seats are manual, apart from the driver's lumbar support, uh, and they're both heated as well in this particular spec. Is that 
do you think another reason why the seats are thinner and allow that leg room? Oh, what, the manualness? Yes. I don't know. I didn't really think about it. There were one of those seats where I set it once and I was quite happy. I never bothered moving it again. Yeah. One of those ones. Well, yes, probably, because that would have, because if they, if they had loads of motors, it would get in the way of people's feet underneath, possibly. But this one well, definitely wasn't taxi spec, so I would expect them to be icon or icon tech. Okay. The center console in the front uh, had armrest with cubby, had another 12-volt socket and a USB port in there as well. I think there was an aux out, uh, aux in even, port. Two pair of cup holders, the electronic handbrake, hill hold switches, drive selector. I've written drive selector shifter lever thing because it's not a gear lever anymore, is it? Nor is it the, it, nor is it the, the sort of automatic transmission lever. Um it's sort of mode selector. It's a, it is a bit like that, yes. The drive mode selector is in front of that. It's a little sort of squiggy thing you can flick back and forth to swap between the different modes of eco, comfort, normal, and sport. More of that later on. Little platform to rest your phone. It wasn't wireless charging, but there was a, another USB socket under the dash. So if you had a, your cable, you'd sort of plug it in and, and leave it forever and ever. Amen. Up on top of that, oh, uh, controls the heated seats down there too, by the way. I'm doing an Andrew and going through every single button in the whole car. It is the correct way to do these things, Alan, that's why. I'm just making this worth a fortnight as opposed to just a week's worth. <laughs> this is a fortnight's worth of review. <laughs> that's a joke, everyone. Up top, a physical aircon controls uh, vents and the sort of perch tablet style nav screen. Again, more of that coming up. The instrument binnacle is a combination of analog and digital. And it's a bit odd because it's a hybrid that has a rev counter. Normally, there's a drive, eco, whatever display, but no, there is actually a rev counter. And this wasn't the sporty version either. No, and this wasn't the sporty version, exactly. And that's on the left. On the right-hand side, there's fuel and temperature gauges, and they are physical gauges. Uh, everything in between, so your speedo and everything, is shown on a, I think it's 4.7 inch, if I remember correctly, color display. It's quite configurable colour, whether you have your speed on a gauge, which was a bit fussy. I find that quite hard to read. So one of the things I spent uh, my my tunnel crossing doing was reconfiguring all the controls. Uh, so I changed it to, to so that it was digital, which I much preferred. It's far less fuzzy, fussy, nice and clear. And then as well as that, you can swap between what you want to see for the sort of powertrain the trip the entertainment the nav info yeah you can yeah. choose that traditional toyota you can, can scroll between different things and then the under each one there's two or three different options of what you want to see so okay. lots of playing about can be had i ended up with the economy meter well there's an economy meter which shows your average fuel consumption stuff or right. there's one that shows how eco your driving is being and because gamification is awesome, <laughs> I went for the how eco your driving is being. Okay. That was just me. I, again, that's just what I like to see. I mean, even in my own car, it's always the, it's actually always the trip meter that I see. I see trip and how far I've gone and how far I, and my range and stuff. You could have exactly the same in the Corolla as you can in the Yaris. Any other miscellaneous buttons are down by the driver's right knee in the traditional Toyota style. But the steering wheel is covered in buttons for the entertainment system, the adaptive cruise, and the lane keeping assist. Again, more on that to come very shortly because now we move into the driving section. Okay, so historically, mm -hmm. driving hasn't been possibly the top thing talked about in cars from toyota in this segment no. however when we had a quick little five minute run around at smmt we both remarked at how pleasant the driving experience was in the one yeah. we tried so i'm i'm hoping for this to be expanded upon because you you drove it that time didn't you you did yeah. the, the hill route at millbrook yeah yeah and i was i was quite impressed with and again it was like a five minute spin round you know twice round the loop you know when i love the way that we're apologizing for this and quite often you you then later on see three thousand word articles written on the basis of about what we're apologizing for is not being very much but yes 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I was impressed with how how good the feel was, how direct the steering was, and it wasn't beige in any way behind the wheel. No, no, exactly. So the thing about this, you're completely right, okay? It was a very... <sighs> Here's the thing. It was smooth, it was quiet, and it was refined. It rode well on British motorways. It rode well on French D roads. And it did that at the same time as not wallowing, not rolling in the corners, even with a bike and a 35 kilos worth of four meter long awning strapped to the top of it. It didn't, you know, it didn't roll. There was, it, it the, even that, which is a, which is an, an edge case and something that you would expect to cause handling aberrations of some way, shape, or form and make you go, uh, just didn't. It, it, this car didn't roll particularly much, I, I didn't feel. The other thing is, even without junk on the roof, when you turn the steering wheel, it went where you pointed it. Mm hmm. Even when you then you realize halfway through that you've overcooked it a bit, and it probably shouldn't still be going exactly where you pointed it because you have no minor paddy as a result of what you think you're about to do to to the press car. But it really did just go where you point it, and it rode well, and all these other things. Now I, I know that that's not really a great analysis of tread shuffle under under duress and is it going to cock a wheel on the Nürburgring and any of that kind of stuff because it's a Toyota Corolla estate folks yeah who's the mar who's it it's target market what's it meant to do for them and it sounds like it more than happily coped with that because you're a dafty who picks up a four meter long awning whilst on holiday as as you do well, and then drives with two of them on the roof along a French D road, and uh, you know, yeah, it is the kind of daft, daft stuff that I end up doing, and it, it's entirely Toyota's own fault. <laughs> it's not really, but if they give me a car with a roof rack, I've got to test the roof rack. It makes perfect sense. So it just felt particularly European. There's supposedly all the the work on the ride and handling was handled by Toyota and their development place in Belgium. So no wonder it rides well on crummy roads if it was developed in in belgium the thing is it was just pleasant it was it's one of these things that we say quite often on here you know we we, we say it about many far eastern brands it was a car and it did what you asked it to do and it always did it really really competently mm -hmm. and that's the kind of car and the kind of segment it is yeah and i'm sure the I've not driven the current generation Focus, but I'm sure that you people would say, well, you know, it's, it's far more dynamic, tread shuffle, understeer, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? It was great. It was perfect for what I was doing, which was cruising around, centre of France, minimum fuss, nice and quiet, deal with the rubbishy roads, which is one of the reasons I ended up taking it, because I always feel kind of guilty when I've got my mum in the car and my own car and it jiggles along, you know? Because you're a good son. Oh, something like that. Don't even start me. Uh, <laughs> something like that, yes. No, no, no that's, that's true. That's not fair. Uh, it was just incredibly refined, whole thing. And as a result, incredibly easy to drive. And I'll come to that a little bit more. Engine motor CVT combo in this car is very, very refined. Okay? So there was very, very rarely the sort of noise-to-go dissonance that puts people off CVTs. So where the engine's making loads of noise, but the car's not really doing anything. I really think that's a fabricated dislike of a different way of propelling a car forward. It's a trope based on a much on mostly on a much older generation. Anyway, what I'm trying to say here is it doesn't really happen. And when it happens, when you notice it, it's because there's a rev counter and it happens when you're climbing 20% gradients on auto routes with a bike and a four meter awning on the roof with this cruise control set at 80 miles an hour then that's going to happen because it's having to work quite hard it's an in extremis well that's no good because we'd be doing that all the time alan everywhere we go i do it every day quite <laughs> uh, the only other time i noticed that kind of thing was on the rare occasions when i decided i was going to touch the flappy paddles okay the one time i decided i was going to touch the flappy paddles 
all they did was make more noise going downhill rather than adding any engine braking, which is what I was actually looking for. But it's not really a big deal because the feel on the brake pedal was really nice and progressive. And I felt it was pretty much seamless in its transition from regen to friction braking. So other hybrids that I've driven, then there's been a moment of panic because that transition hasn't been so smooth. Never felt that in this. And I was doing all sorts of stuff, town driving, country driving, driving on motorways and having to stop and stuff like that. Never an issue. That transition was pretty much seamless. And there was there was feel underneath the, the pedal. I've already mentioned a bunch of different modes. I was in either normal or eco most of the time. Mm-hmm. I did not feel the urge to press sport and make the display turn red. Oh, Well, that was mostly it. Eco made the display turn green. <laughs> Normal had the display turn blue. I mean, we can predict this like mad now, can't we? <laughs> Sport made the display turn red. Whoa, well done. How did you guess? <laughs> yeah, the difference is really... Uh, certainly between normal and eco were in the response per throttle travel and, okay. and the mapping there so eco it just meant you were super smooth all the time normal i'd switch to on the auto route because it didn't really make much difference but it meant that if you did need to jab the pedal to to change lanes and stuff it was there was a bit less lag it was just a little bit punchier okay. uh, for that most of the time on the auto route i had the cruise set so it wasn't a big deal yep economy Okay, this is a hybrid, and this is one way consumers can now go towards a lower emission vehicle. Did you actually use the H word? I have avoided using the H word, and I definitely haven't used the marketing term. I've not used the marketing term, but I did use the I've H no- word. Okay. Because you mentioned that it was one. Did I? I just thought I said there was an engine motor CVT combo. Actually, no, at the very start. Oh, drat, so I did. Uh, oh, Never mind. So I averaged 45.2 miles per gallon over 1,553.5 miles. 1,062 of those were at French motorway speeds with a bike on the roof. Okay. Half of those, one th- roughly half of those 1,062, also had a four meter long awning with a foot long square end, you know, square foot of, of end facing into the wind. Okay. Plus straps holding it on. So where does that show up on the uh, WLTP test then? Are you now going to be employed by NCAP to... (laughs) It is definitely something that should be taken into consideration, WLTP. So WLTP figures are 50.4 to 53.2 miles per gallon for this. I got significantly below that because I was driving in no way, shape or form in the way that they do on the tests. I felt that that was really very good for yeah. what I had been doing with the car. As a comparison, same journey, GRMN, nothing on the roof, 28 to the gallon. Okay, okay, I know, different engine, different size of car, all these kind of things, uh, you know, completely tuned for a completely different reason, but still, 28 I get in that. I would easily have been well over 50. Yeah. well over 50 in this and when i was cruising about with not much on the roof and stuff i was well over the wltp figures so please understand that that is the worst you can expect to get from this i think only towing a caravan could have been much worse to be honest <laughs> yes there was a weird thing even when i was pottering around i could never get the battery level to indicate much more than about two-thirds full Now, I don't know if this was my driving style. There was a sheet that came with the car and a laminated sheet. And on one side, it had the specs. Mm. On the other side, it had sort of hints on how to drive your Prius. And the first line was, drive it like you would drive an electric car. And I didn't really read any further than that because I've driven an electric car. And I'm all right at that. I can get the range out of an electric car. So that's what I did. On the eco driving score thing that it always shows you when you turn it off, I was consistently over 80%, if not 90% on that. So I don't know. Just I I actually I actually think it's probably a good thing that it never reached that because it would still go for very long periods in electric only mode. Up to 70 miles an hour, it would quite happily just if you're on a light very light throttle, it would sit there quite happily in EV mode for 
a couple of miles in cases where there were down where there was downhill you know where it was sort of undulate your know, traditional french view of an arrow straight route nationale yeah nice and smooth down the down one side up the other side down the next side so it basically surfing on generating using it a little bit to get up and then generating again on the next on the next down so i was never building up lots of energy but on the other hand it was spending an awful lot of time in ev mode so i think i was doing it right mm-hmm the only outcome i've got from this is i think i was doing it right it may be yeah it'd be be interesting to see if you'd had it um say in a more uh british urban setting how that may have gone i don't know if that would have charged the battery a bit more maybe i mean i was driving in bone and in shallow and stuff no but I, what i mean is you would have had a more understandable usage or more expected usage is what I was thinking. You, you know what to expect having driven EVs in those sort of areas. Yeah, th- this was a bit more like charging around Britain, to be honest. Yeah. It was more that kind of scenario, really, and those kind of roads. One of the things that, that I did find interesting about this is something I've wanted to do for quite a long time is take a hybrid on a long journey. Mm-hmm. Because everybody thinks of their use cases being purely in towns and cities, I was curious to see what they're like and if it was just going to run on petrol all the time. Yeah. Now, when you're at 80, you're above the threshold for the electric coming in. So it is always keeping the petrol engine going. Yeah. Even if it's like only turning over at like 500 revs, it's always just there. And even when you're regening at that speed, uh, it it's there. Um, and I was really actually impressed by how well it dealt with that and again when you slowed down just a little bit as soon as you reached traffic anything like that just how quickly it flicked into electric and i think that that's what's interesting and clever about these is the way that they store the energy to use extra when they need to and then mm. they're not so sort of wasting it in between times what else was that all i wanted to talk about from that kind of stuff i think so the one bit that's still left kind of Theories neatly from driving into technology, really. And that was how good the active cruise and the lane assist were. Okay. The active cruise was better than some German marks. I didn't feel it was quite as good as the one in the Volkswagen e Golf. Okay. Which is, uh, for me, the gold standard of active cruise, partly because it has the no undertake mode. So it's always watching the lane to your right to make sure you don't go shooting up and undertaking people which I like. I think that's a really good thing to have. But particularly on the way down, because the road was was quite quiet. It was much busier on my way back up. It dawned on me after a couple of hundred miles that I couldn't work out what using a, and here's some verbal inverted commas, more advanced assist system, close the inverted commas, would give me if I were using it legally over what was fitted to this. Because what I had was a very, very smooth cruise control which was very predictable in when it was going to sense a vehicle in front so you could always sort of move out and and, you know change lanes before it sort of started to draw you up short Uh, and also a very smooth lane keeping assist which kept me nicely central in my lane had my hands on the wheel alert with what was going on obviously and when i indicated it would sort of just let me move the direction that i was indicating and then stop indicating sent you know and then you'd be in center of the lane passed and then pulled back across to the right again and it made for very very relaxed driving even on a long very dull run mm. many people have been have, have done that that particular drive this this summer and i'm sure will agree with me that when you get south of Reims, it is and towards toi it is very very boring it was great and very low stress and relaxed but pleasant driving with you still involved i don't understand what anything short of the car will always drive itself is going to give me over over that at the moment yeah so the drivetrain and all that stuff uh, and some of that sort of technology I- i've covered that in great gory detail in a special edition all of its own it's number 200 uh, and i spent the day with richard seymour chatting about a Toyota hybrid system and then driving from the very first gen prius up to the latest generation of rxl 
Lexus RXL. So if you want to know all about the hybrid system, how that works, why it's epicyclic, just the story behind it, then do go listen to that. There'll be a link in the show notes, but it's number 200. Entertainment system. I can't say a huge amount about the entertainment system. It has changed slightly in that model year, which also gives you the electronic rear tailgate. You now get CarPlay. Woo! Yay! The JBL system and the speakers are good. I think I'd need to hear how it was against the standard system before deciding it was worth the extra. But on the other hand, I might also just order it as a carryout against the standard system being a bit muffled. I enjoyed the sound I got through it. There you okay. go. I mean, that, that that sounds a bit naff, but mostly it was Auto Root FM and uh, Skyrock, uh, my two normal ones for sort of driving down through France. Yeah, it was perfectly good. Uh, the navigation system was Toyota Navigation. Uh, once you're used to it, it's just fine. It annoyed me more than more than it will annoy most because whilst it has the same number of buttons around the outside of the screen that perform the same functions as on my car, the function to button location does not tie up. <laughs> so I had a lot of so so muscle button, memory. So buttons are great and all, <laughs> but once you've got it programmed into your muscle memory, and then you keep finding you're pressing the wrong button, it's a little frustrating. Uh, but that's that's more to me because I'm swapping to something very similar but different. Okay, I think if you're fresh to it, you wouldn't even notice that that was the case. Car had Toyota safety system that consists of a whole load of things, some of which I've already mentioned. Uh, just to run through them, they are a pre-collision system, adaptive cruise, lane departure alert, lane trace assist, which I've talked about. That's the keeping you in the right lane. Uh, automatic high beam, road sign assist, which was particular. I've got to credit it for being particularly consistent and accurate. Drive start control, which stops you pulling away into the back of someone else. And I want to point out that I had no false positives from this. Okay, good. Uh, which was pretty good. And that was sort of, there were bugs and all sorts of things getting splattered on the front of the car. And it still didn't give me false positives. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, one thing you'll notice is missing there was was blind spot monitoring, by the way. It didn't have blind spot monitoring. You can't order it with blind spot monitoring. I didn't find that there was a particularly big blind spot. But particularly when you start out with a with a car, maybe this is a bit of a mojo issue, then it's nice to know it's there so you're not sort of having an accident before you've kind of got your head around the, the scale of the car and stuff. After a while, I didn't notice. The only thing it had which I didn't have a chance to try out, I think it was probably about the only button in the whole flipping car I didn't press, was the simple intelligent park assist, which will help you into parallel parking or parking square onto the road. I just had no need to try it. It's simple because you still have to, you know, press the brake and change the gear and stuff. It doesn't just magically wick you in with a press for single button. I just didn't have a chance to, to try it. We just tried different. I normally try these things out actually in Chalons or so, uh, but we parked in a different car park this time and I didn't get a chance to, to play with it because it was didn't work that way. Uh, verdict. Yeah, come on then. I think we've got a hint that you didn't dislike it. No, I, I, what I'm no, I, I I liked it lots. It was smooth. It was quiet. It was adequately fast. It had the right amount of space without being too big. Something I should probably have said about the exterior. You never had an issue finding spaces or fitting it into a car parking space. It was the right size. I know that sounds silly but it was just the right size. Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Uh, and it was adaptable. You can have a slightly lifted version if you want a ruggedness or the sportier version for more sportiness. And you can have the comfy version that I had for comfort. Which brings us to the point that I'm still puzzling over why you would want something fancier other than for badge appeal. It's the same thing, I think, that I came back with after tramping around Europe in that uh, i30 uh, N-Line with the 1.4 litre engine last summer. It was significantly less expensive than this. It was much lower trim level, but it was the same thing where you get back and you think, why do people need much more than this? Yeah, uh, And that was the outcome in my head was, why do you want a more prestigious badge? Uh, it, Other than you want the badge appeal. Who are they fighting for? 
for customers? Who? Toyota. Toyota. With this. Um, do you think? Probably a little bit of Hyundai Kia, a bit of uh, a bit of Vauxhall for the Astro Focus. They're not making the step up to people who look at an A3 or a one series and i don't know i I think there is a certain amount of that but i think that if you're going for that you're probably well maybe if you're going for an a3 because the lexus ct200 really i I don't know why it's still on the price list it might not be anymore it was when i last checked a couple of months ago because i don't know why you would want that over this The, the they are like chalk and cheese they really are completely different generations of hybrid powertrain of interior quality of all these things despite the fact that lexus has a fancy badge Mm. you know the lexus ux i could understand because maybe you want a sort of slightly suv size you want one that's that's a bit higher yet but you want that badge so that's why i understand why you'd want the lexus ux to be perfectly honest yeah yeah. if you like the 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 format and the and the looks i don't think that you're going to be cross checking a maybe a one series actually but I don't really think I don't know the Audi A3 just doesn't it doesn't figure in my head that somebody who'd be looking at that would also be cross buying against the against the, the it's slightly Corolla. different. I mean, it would only be the hatchback, wouldn't it? Really, anyway. Yeah, it's not the Tourer. Well, you'd maybe have the Tourer instead of the hat instead of the A3 Sportback, which is the only size really. Mm. I don't know. I couldn't work this one out to be perfectly honest, because that's what I because you know when I. I know that we both do it when we've got press cars. We are trying to work out. So what's this actually? What are people... Who's buying this? And you spend your time myopically looking at the drivers of any other ones you see on the road and then making judgments about them. Yes. And you go, well, and what else would they be looking at? And who's not going to be buying this? Yeah. So I figure that if you want an Audi E3, you probably want to be all sporty. And so you're not really going to be looking at this unless you're looking at the GR Sport one. Because of past as well, because of yeah the, the past, yeah, there's... you know, the carry on of that baggage, yeah. Uh, and as you say, I think the um, badge snobbery, which it's uh, a number one thing, why you wouldn't choose yeah. it. Uh, the other thing, by the way, the other car, of course, uh, is the Mazda three, and you're probably actually against the CX thirty is probably the closest from Mazda because if you're going for the estate, if you're yeah. looking hatch to hatch, then then obviously the Mazda three. But this is against the CX thirty. Mm. I was pitching this to little sister, mm-hmm. just a bit more space. But I think she's going to go for something a bit higher because smallish person previously concussed tried to pick wiggly toddler in and out. I think actually that the higher seating of the baby seat is important. Yes, reasons to choose an SUV, folks. They do actually exist, even if you don't really want to buy an SUV. They do have their purposes, but they are for specific reasons. Which is off topic of what we're actually meant to be talking about, which is, of course, to go to Corolla, the Touring Sports 2 litre XL, which I liked lots. Good. There we go. I'm glad you did, because I think it's a very handsome car. Yeah. And I liked my incredibly brief time behind the wheel. Yeah, well, that was what, one of the things that inspired me to, to get it that. Anyway, don't forget that between now and next time, you can give us any feedback and share your thoughts with the show uh, at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com, the hub of all our activities. Please don't forget to leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing. Andrew, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is via Twitter. If you search for Crack Wintering, you should find me there. And Alan, if people would, would like to know what is the perfect way to tie a four metre long awning to a roof rack, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you personally? <laughs> um, yes, for that kind of advice, it's best to use Twitter where I'm at AJP Bradley. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y. We'll be back before very long. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring.